Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I host this series of half-hour weekly cable access programs produced here at the studios of Portland Community Media. Today our guest is Portland Public Interest Attorney Dan Meek. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, David. All right, yeah, you've been involved with uh, campaign finance reform, legislation, initiatives, and so forth in Oregon for how many years? Well, I guess since about 1980. Two okay. mainly. So a few years About under your belt. Thirty years. Okay, right. Not like Lloyd, your previous guest. He's uh, got. He's up around forty years. I've really? Been doing oh, it, yes. okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so what's been going on with the Oregon Legislature for the past, well, what, a couple months? Well, nothing. Nothing important, actually. <laughs> um, they tried to. Um, uh, eviscerate campaign finance re reporting back in the 2011 session. They tried to pass a bill that would allow um, all candidates and measures not to report any of their contributions or expenditures for any month simply by paying a $5,000 fine. And when you take into account that some campaigns bring in a million dollars a month in Oregon, particularly those for statewide office like for governor or in for ballot measures, mm -hmm. that's quite a small price to pay to be excused from all campaign finance reporting. And it wasn't until uh, the, um, the Oregonian wrote a story about it that it, it really reversed the trend. The bill passed the Senate uh, 29 to nothing before we heard about it. So then uh, we made a stink about it and got an article in the Oregonian and it eventually was defeated in the House on the floor by a vote of 55 to 4. So that's about it. And then this mm -hmm. past legislative session was, um, you know, once again just playing defense. Uh, we, uh, I testified against a bill that would have um, uh, made it a felony to send an email or a tweet or any kind of communication to anyone else suggesting uh, civil disobedience. Hmm. You know, civil disobedience in Oregon light is you know, you know, being at a place where you're, you know, where the police tell you to move and you don't, that's a misdemeanor and it's a, it's a very you know, small fine, small penalty and of course no jail time. What this bill would have done would, would have been if I had sent you an email saying, hey David, let's go downtown to the Occupy or Portland demonstration uh, you know, now and, and see what's going on, and, and if the police ask us to move, let's not move. That would be a felony, uh, punishable by uh, five years in jail and a $100,000 fine. Hmm. And the part that would make that increased um, uh, penalty was because you said, let's Let's go down. Let's go down there and not necessarily and, and obey police and orders. And not obey the police orders. Right. right. So any okay. kind of civil disobedience, uh -huh. where you know, where you uh, stand on the street, for example, and not move when the police tell you to move, that right. would that would have converted just suggesting that into a felony, mm -hmm. which also means, of course, even though even though the offense itself would only be a misdemeanor, misdemeanor. right? Okay. And also, it means that it would give the police access to all of your emails because, after all, they have to have access to your emails to prove that you're guilty. Uh -huh. Right. So, okay. Yeah. And so, so what happened with that? That that uh, was heard before the Senate um, Rules Committee and did not and did not proceed beyond that. Uh -huh. Okay. But of course, for me, the most important thing of any legislative session is that it does nothing about campaign finance reform. And, and our latest le legislative session is exactly was exactly the same, the same of, of, as all of them. Oregon, the Oregon Legislature has never adopted limits on political contributions. Oregon voters have done so several times, mm -hmm. but or the Oregon uh, Legislature has not. Okay, right. Measure 47 was the last time that we did that. Right, and um, the, the first slide I have here just sort of uh, reminds voters of that, reminds folks of, vote, of that. Uh, we did enact strict campaign finance reform in 2006. Mm -hmm. It banned all corporate and union contributions and independent expenditures by corporations and unions. It limited mm -hmm. individuals to relatively or considered small amount. The the curious part is that after Oregon voters enacted this in 2006, the Oregon Attorney General and Secretary of State have refused to enforce it, even though no court has found any of Measure 47 to be unconstitutional or invalid. Okay, and, and no court would ever do so unless they enforce it, because uh, it would never be challenged. True. Right. So we filed a lawsuit against the Secretary of State and Attorney General in 2006 to compel them to enforce it, to do their duty, and that case is now before the Oregon Supreme Court. We had oral argument in this January, and I would expect a decision from the Supreme Court within a couple of months. The only, the newest development in campaign finance reform is a, is a curious thing, and that's the, the next slide here. 
the only Republican, the only person running in the Republican primary for Secretary of State, who of course can enforce this law, is a orthopedic surgeon in Bend named Newt Bueller. Um, and I found this back in the Eugene Register Guard in 1995, mm -hmm. which is describing a signal accomplishment of the American Party. Now the American Party was the, the party that Ross Perot's people created in 1992 to put him on the ballot in Oregon. It continued to be a political party in Oregon for another few years. And it said that the, its, its signal accomplishment was its co-sponsorship of 1994 Ballot Measure 9, which also was strict campaign finance reform, the American Party became a co-sponsor of Measure 9 through the efforts of then Vice Chairman Newt Bueller, okay. a <laughs> physician residing in Tualatin. So uh, Newt Bueller um, was at very active in advocating for campaign finance reform in Oregon before I was, and he also was active in, um, in minor party uh, creation and operation before I was. Hmm. Um, so it was. It's very interesting that he's now the the Republican candidate for for Secretary of State. Okay, uh, and the, and the Democratic Party candidate is Kate Brown. Is Kate Brown? That's right. right. Okay. okay. And there may be there may be some other there may be some minor party candidates as well. Mm -hmm. So what's happened um, since um, the in the limits aren't being enforced, and since the Measure Nine limits were struck down in 1997 is that camp total spending on Oregon candidate campaigns, as indicated by the slide, has increased from $4.2 million now to $58 million. So it's increased by a factor of 20 uh, over the past um, 14 years. Mm. And I'm not sure, I don't think voters really know more about the candidates now than they did then. They're just being bombarded with 30-second television ads and radio ads, uh, and that's, that's primarily where the, where the money mm -hmm. goes. It now costs, as the next slide indicates, um, in 2010, the winners of contested Senate races spent up to essentially a million dollars and typically half a million. The winners of contested House races spent up to 600000 and typically spent more than 400000 uh, In one case, a house, in a House race, the expenditure was $1.1 million a couple of years ago. And only 3% of the money came in contributions of $250 or less. So if you, so politicians can basically ignore the average citizen. Even, you know, the average citizen contributes nothing. 98% of Oregonians make no campaign contributions at all. And uh, even if you make a contribution of 250 uh, or in that range, you can be totally ignored because 97% of the contributions come in larger amounts. Mm -hmm. All right. It's, it's, so with the uh, Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court, what, what, what effect has that had on campaign spending? Um, in Oregon, for Oregon races, I would say it has had no effect at all. Because since we're not enforcing the law uh, that limits contributions directly to candidates, mm -hmm. that corporations and unions and, and wealthy individuals were doing the same thing in Oregon, that Citizens United has now authorized them to do uh, on a national level. Just to remind folks of Citizens United, um, it was a case decided by the Oregon Supreme Court in January of 2010. Uh, there were briefs in favor of it filed not only by the corporations, but also by the ACLU, which stands behind Citizens United is in favor of it, mm -hmm. and the AFL-CIO. Curiously enough, the AFL-CIO has been putting out documents recently um, um, saying how much they are against Citizens United, but they filed a brief in favor of the corporate position all the way down the line to the Supreme Court uh, before the Citizens United decision. Mm -hmm. okay. So the result of Citizens United is really on a federal level. And this next slide shows um, what's been happening. Before Citizens United, most independent expenditures in federal races, that is, uh, folks who get together and just put on their own ads without the candidate, most of that money was going to benefit Democrats, and that is the blue bars. As you will see, go went way up between oh, yeah. 2000 and 2008. Then Citizens United came in, and the, the, what the difference that that made is that previous to Citizens United, the corporations and unions could not use their treasury money to make independent expenditures. Wealthy individuals could use their money. So in unleashing the corporations and the unions, the result in 2010, was basically the amount spent to favor Republicans went up, but the amount spent to favor uh, Democrats went down. Mm -hmm. And this next chart indicates the sort of the balance that until Citizens United, Democrats were getting most of the benefit from independent expenditures through up through 2008. They were getting like almost 70%. Citizens United came along and brought that down 
to about 40 percent. And so that's really the difference. Once you unleash the corporations, they give more money, obviously, to Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, the next slide is, is finally the two what's been happening in 2012 so far. And this shows independent expenditures by industry. The blue is to liberals, mainly Democrats. The red is to conservatives, mainly Republicans. And you can see that virtually every industry is, is expending more for Republicans than Democrats, most to a, a large degree, except for the uh, entertainment industry called mm -hmm. TV, movies, music, and except for um, the miscellaneous unions. So essentially, Citizens United has changed the balance, such, such as there was, mm -hmm. um, so, that, um, so that more money is now uh, benefiting Republicans than Democrats. Okay, all right, well that's, uh, <laughs> so why when the Democrats had the opportunity to overturn or at least modify, restrict Citizens United. Why didn't that happen? Well, you might remember that Citizens United came down in January 2010. Democrats had essentially 60 percent majorities in both the U.S. House of Representatives and in the Senate for all of the rest of the, of the year of 2010, and they could have done something. Um, they ended up doing absolutely nothing. Uh, they couldn't even uh, get it together to require disclosure of where this new independent expenditure money was coming from. And uh, I'll get to that in a second. Congress could have, however, as the, the next slide indicates, could have done something very effective. It could simply have removed jurisdiction from the federal courts to review the constitutionality of laws on campaign finance reform. The, US, the Congress determines and sets the jurisdiction of the U.S. Supreme Court. And in many cases, including immigration reform, pr prison litigation reform, and the False Claims Act, the Congress has simply said that the U.S. Supreme Court and all federal courts shall have no authority to review this law. Hmm. That's all that the that's all that Congress had to do in order to in order to nullify Citizens United is say, we passed the McCain-Feingold Act in you know 2003, and it's in, in these, the courts don't have jurisdiction to review its constitutionality. Um, one of the, the proponents of, of recognizing with this power of Congress is actually Antonin Scalia, um, who um, has voted in just in the past couple of years to uphold uh, various uh, laws enacted by Congress, particularly the Detainee Treatment Act of 2005, which, which uh, expressly removed the jurisdiction of the federal courts to review the law. <laughs> so Congress could have done that easily. Um, Congress could also, uh, by I could have added two more members to the Supreme Court and reheard Citizens United. And two more Obama appointees presumably would have resulted in a six to five decision upholding the law instead of a five to four decision striking down the law. Mm -hmm. And that again could be done uh, could be done by simple law of Congress. It has been done in the past um, eight times. Congress has changed the number of justices on the Supreme Court, but they didn't do that either. Um, they didn't do anything, and the reason we're given is that, um, well, we didn't, we only had a, we only, uh, for example, our dis dis the act to require disclosure of where the independent expenditures are coming from, it passed the House, where we had, the Democrats had a majority, but it didn't pass the Senate because the vote was only 59 to 39 in favor of it. That's a majority. That is a majority, but the Democrats allowed the Republicans to get away with requiring 60%, 60 votes, or a 60% vote. Uh, in order to close debate on any bill. So in that case, debate wasn't closed and no debate, and that was the vote on, on what's called cloture, on shutting off debate. Um, I, of course, have argued that it doesn't take 60 votes to shut off debate. It only takes a bare majority, 51 votes. And curiously enough, um, in 2001, the Democrats and Harry Reid did exactly that. It's called the nuclear option, mm -hmm. where if something is on the floor of the House that presumably requires a, a, a supermajority vote, you simply um, uh, move to have the vote set aside because it's, because it's unconstitutional. It's not, it's not a majority vote, and that's what is required by the Constitution. The chair, whoever is in the, in the chair, rules against you, but then you can, the Senate can vote, and by majority vote, overturn the ruling of the chair. And that's what they did in a matter, in, in a bill in 2001, October 6, 2001, um, which happened to do with um, amendments to China currency legislation, kind of a minor matter. But nevertheless, the Democrats invoked a nuclear option and by a vote of 51 to 48, um, shut off debate. Hmm. So they can shut off debate when they want to, 
But when it came to Citizens United, they did not want to shut off debate. And I can only, I can only imagine that they didn't want to shut off debate because up until the Citizens United decision, most of the money, most of the corporate, most of the independent expenditure money, number one, and most of the direct corporate contributions to individual candidates and political parties um, were going to the Democrats. Hmm. They were getting slightly more than the Republicans of the corporate money and of the independent expenditure money. And so they figured, you know, why, why uh, shut off our, our money flow? Um, we want to spend the big bucks. We want to be dependent upon the, the corporations and, and the, the wealthy individuals and to a, a, less, a far lesser degree the unions because they have far less money. But it was the Democrats who, who, who were not, ag the majority of Democrats were not against, mm -hmm. were not against um, Citizens United and thought that they would benefit from it. And, but, uh, so for both, for both the Democrats and the Republicans, democracy is not really a value. Um, grassroots democracy is not a value. Grassroots democracy. But, uh, taking money from, from big sources and, and spending it on 30 second TV ads is. So is as long value. as democracy can be bought, it's okay. That's right. Right, okay. And now they're, now they're, um, they are reaping the whirlwind, so to speak, because um, large uh, wealthy donors and corporations, once, now they have a choice between someone who supports them 90% of the time, the Democrat, mm -hmm. and somebody who supports them 100% of the time, the Republican, they're gonna go with 100%. Mm -hmm. And so that's what caused the U.S. House of Representatives to, to flip, in, I think, to, in 2010, is that suddenly how Republican candidates for the House had a lot more money. And, and so with the Republicans taking control, then the ability, or the, the expected ability for them to like override the filibuster or or pass the, like the disclosure act pretty much disappeared correct so the democrats, democrats kind of cooked their own goose they did and right. now that the republicans control the house um disclosure won't be passed uh and uh, certainly not certainly no uh, limits on independent expenditures uh, will be passed mm -hmm. uh, by the house and of course now now that the regime has changed to allow unlimited corporate expenditures, um, most of observers expect the U.S. Senate will also have a majority of Republicans beginning next year. Mm -hmm. That is um, because the Republicans will now be able to vastly outspend the Democrats in the um, in the November 2012 election. And once that happens, the the um, the only direction for campaign finance reform is is uh, from from worst to worst. I mean, it, it could don't, now they could, they'll probably remove the limits on, or the ban on corporate contributions directly to candidates, mm -hmm. um, uh, requiring disclosure of those contributions as well. That's mm -hmm. what I would expect. Mm -hmm. And um, presumably, uh, President Obama will be reelected and can veto those things. He can veto them. Whether he will veto them is, <laughs> is you know, another matter. Mm -hmm. Takes a spine. Well, it does. and. Um, uh, when it came time to, in 2008, to decide whether he was going to use public funding on you know, the federal public funding to run for president, mm -hmm. or take um, contributions from um, you know, a lot of wealthy individuals, he chose to take the contributions from wealthy individuals mm -hmm. so that he could outspend, signi significantly outspend McCain. McCain did accept public funding mm -hmm. and did not accept uh, contributions from, you know, large contributions from individuals. Right. And of course, at that time, um, Corporate um, independent expenditures were not allowed. Right. Yeah. And so this year, for sure, well, I, I would assume that th this uh, year we would not expect either the Democrats or the Republicans to accept public funds. Oh, that's. I, I think that's um, absolutely correct. Yeah. Right. That the that the public funding program for presidential elections is dead mm -hmm. because both parties, the candidates of, of either party, can raise far more money than public funding would mm -hmm. provide. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what uh, does does what the Supreme Court in Montana, the actions that they took with regard to Citizens United, does that offer us any hope, or is is that uh, just uh, only affect Montana? Uh, could it spread, or well, um, for for the time first, uh, tell us what happened right. in Montana. In Mon Montana, has for many decades had a law uh, that prohibited. Um, uh, corporate independent expenditures and ballot measure campaigns, and um, the uh, in after the Citizens United decision, 
the corporations in Montana got together and, and sued to declare that the Montana law unconstitutional. The Montana Supreme Court, in a split decision, um, upheld the constitutionality of that law and um, claimed that the, the Citizens United decision had, had um, one of the, in fact, the basis for the Citizens United decision was, well, there's no proof of, of corruption by, you know, corporations um, and, and, and uh, campaign, oops, and politics. So the Montana case involved uh, the presentation of a, of a long history of corruption uh, centering around Anaconda Copper, Copper Company, which essentially owned the state for, for many decades um, uh, when it was first made a state in the late 1800s, and um, lots of corruption. Mm -hmm. So the Montana Supreme Court said, well, we've, got lot, we've had a history of, of corporate corruption here, so we're going to, we're going to uphold the law as being, as being you know, reason, uh, reasonable and necessary. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has now um, noted jurisdiction of, of effect, what is effectively an appeal of that to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I would expect the U.S. Supreme Court to, to reverse the Montana Supreme Court by the end of June. Each the U.S. Supreme Court sessions begin in October and end at the oh. end of June, mm -hmm. and they'll probably just um, they'll probably just uh, summarily reverse that. Okay. So um, it is it was certainly an act of of a little bit of defiance or some defiance by the Montana Supreme Court. It ultimately will have no effect nationwide, it, and probably will have no effect in Montana. But again, it um, it it starts it could be the, you know, the start of a movement to um, overturn Citizens United, but that's really not going to happen until, until one of the five members of the court um, um, dies, basically. What do you think about the efforts of Move to Amend, to amend the Constitution? Well, Move to Amend, uh, I very much support, and as um, the, uh, let me get to the Move to Amend stuff, it's, of course, very difficult to amend the U.S. Constitution. In order to um, propose an amendment, you have to have a two-thirds vote in both houses of, of Congress, the Senate and the House. Or you need to have two-thirds of all of the state legislatures to petition for a constitutional convention. Mm -hmm. um, once there is a, um, once either the, either the Congress proposes one by two-thirds vote, it then goes to the states, it has to be ratified by three-fourths of all the states. So 13 states alone can veto it. If the states petition for a constitutional convention, that, hasn't, that has never happened, and the, there's of course concern that the constitutional convention could go crazy and propose all sorts of new amendments to the Constitution that have nothing to do with, with campaign finance reform. Um, but then, you know, the difficulty in either case is to get a three-quarters vote by, by the state, by the state legislatures to approve it, um, considering that um, 25 state legislatures are now controlled by the Republican Party and eight are split Democratic-Republican, and that 22, the folks in 22 states voted for John McCain in 2008. <laughs> so uh, getting three-fourths three of the states to, um, to do this is going to be difficult. I would say the, um, it's a, certainly a long-term project and a very admirable long-term project. Um, the, I would say the more likely way that campaign finance reform at the federal level is going to be saved is that one of the five justices um, dies, um, of course it would have to be, it would have to be one of the, 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 the justices who voted in favor of Citizens United are on the whole quite, quite a bit younger than the justices who voted against it. Right. Uh -huh. So um, that would have to occur, there would have to be a president who would appoint a good justice and there would have to be a Senate that would, that would confirm that justice. Um, You're not painting an optimistic picture, no. Dan. Not at all. <laughs> or, or the Democrats retake control of the House mm -hmm. and, and then stand up to the Republicans in the Senate and, pa and take away the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court on campaign finance reform cases to, you know, to overturn campaign finance reform laws. They can do that by a simple majority vote. So if they hold the Senate and, and they take back the House, the Democrats, they can if they want to. Now that they know that the that unleashing the corporations to make these independent expenditures actually harms the Democratic Party a lot, now that they know that, 
um, maybe they would vote to remove the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. Okay, maybe in an ira in, a, in a rational moment. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dan, very much for being here. It was a good program. Hey, David. Right. Yeah. The, the time goes quickly. Actually, we do have uh, we do still have um, almost two minutes. W summary statement, or or any any ray of hope or. <laughs> Well, the um, ray of hope, uh, it all, as I say, it all depends on whether the Democrats wake up and, um, and vote to remove Supreme Court jurisdiction over it. Um, the Supreme Court in the 1930s essentially was negating the New Deal. Um, that the Congress, there was, again, uh, majorities in Congress and, of course, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was president. When Franklin Roosevelt was president and, and his New Deal was being attacked by the Supreme Court and, of course, by the corporations, uh, he was running for re-election in 1936, and he said, we had to struggle with the old enemies of peace, business and financial monopoly, speculation, reckless banking, war profiteering. And he concluded, never before in our history have these forces been so united against one candidate as they stand today. Hmm. They are unanimous in their hatred for me, in their hate for me, and I welcome their <laughs> hatred. Now that was the president uh -huh. running for re-election in 1936. Uh, our president today, uh, when asked by the press, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach out to Republicans and I'm going to say, what can we work together on? There are going to be some things that we can't agree on, you know, philosophically. Uh, the press asks, well, haven't you already tried that? Well, I have, but I'm just going to keep on trying. Okay. So there's, there's quite a difference. Uh, yes, there is. Unfortunately, I asked you for a ray of hope and you didn't give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> there well, was a ray of hope in 1936. <laughs> right, yeah. So uh, thank you, Dan, for being here. Uh, Dan is also associated with the Oregon Progressive Party, so I just wanted to highlight that. And in, the, in closing, we'll just bring up that website. Well, it's uh, www.progparty.org. Uh, in terms of a future action, David Cobb, who is heading up the Move to Amend effort nationally as their chief spokesman, uh, will be in Portland on April 16th. He will, be, he will most likely be at 7 p.m. and at this point is tentatively, uh, we misspelled tentatively, uh, tentatively at First Unitarian Church in downtown Portland at 12th and Salmon. So I hope you'll, we'll see you there. The Department of Ecology is going to have a hearing on Hanford. Uh, they need to uh, issue some kind of a permit uh, in order for more materials to be stored at Hanford, and so that's what the topic of the of the hearing is. You'll be able to make comments. That is Tuesday, May 15th at 7 p.m. Red Lion on the River, which is at Jansen Beach here in Portland, 909 North Hayden Island Drive. So the mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Please visit our website, nationalthealliancefordemocracy.org, or the Portland website, www.afd-pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today, Roger Bates, Beth Kerwin, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thank you for watching. We hope we will see you again next week. Bye.